there literally is nothing actual like biological or developmental about love languages Mm -hmm. in our brains. There's been research to try to see if that is the case. And so far, completely inconclusive. All right, everyone, it is interview time, and we are here with Anne Hodder Ship of, uh, well, many things, but everyone deserves sex ed. It will, we'll uh, start with that. Anne holds many titles, has created a lot of magic in the human sexuality field and realm, including a book that is out called Speaking from the Heart, Eight Languages of Modern 18, Love. 18. Oh, 18. Sorry, I missed 10 of them. <laughs> uh, 18 Languages of Modern Love. Uh, and and I've uh, if, if everyone's heard of the love languages, the five love languages, this is um, an exp- much needed expansion on that. And we'll talk more about why. Um, but we are super excited. You all heard about Anne already a little bit in the intro, in the bio. But Anne, can you please tell our listeners a little bit more about how you got to where you are today in the field of sexuality? Yeah. Well, pretty soon out of journalism school, I went from I immediately moved to Los Angeles And figured or assumed I would be in like the fashion world as an editor of some kind. And then after my first fashion writing job was horrifying, I was like, "Mm, I need a new job and very quickly got a job at a magazine that covered the adult industry. Oh, And so while I was there, started the sex toy section because they they didn't have one. And that's how I met a bunch of sex toy people and really sort of dove into that world and still very much work with sex with companies for a bunch of stuff. But um, that kind of started my trajectory into what eventually became like an accidental entrepreneur real um, stage of my life, which I'm still in, I suppose. This was back in like 2009. And uh, during that, I was asked to be the editor of a sex blog, sex website for LA Weekly. And so By doing that, people called me and considered me a sex educator. And for sure, I was educating by writing and researching, but I just didn't feel comfortable with that title. And so I was able to uh, go to a really fantastic, very intensive training in 2015. And that's kind of where... right? Missy, yeah, yeah, yeah. I did, I did, I did Missy in 2008 as oh, well. Oh, that's right. Yes. yes. Yeah. Oh, my yeah. gosh. Yeah. So that's kind of what um, officially sparked the sex education side of things, where I started to, in addition to working with sex toy companies, doing, you know, writing and PR, kind of that, that stuff. I was working with, like, teenagers, adults in rehabs, I mean, couples, all kinds of really interesting places doing, like, sex and relationship education. And then just kept doing my own training and professional development while also trying to develop that side of my business. And so, um, and that's what everyone deserves sex ed is. Oh yeah. I've known you for a long time as Mm -hmm. well. And I loved when you came out with this, that everyone deserves sex ed. And this isn't really, this is kind of like, just because this is a lot of of work that you've done around this and you've helped people in the retail industry. Mm -hmm. I've noticed with their sex education, which is so needed because folks that are in the pleasure products industry, they're selling lube, they're selling sex toys, they're selling orgasms, right? And hopefully they care about humans on the other side of those orgasms. And there wasn't a solid format for folks out there to get sex education, like trusted inside the industry. People either wanted it for themselves, but I love that companies are bringing you on board to train their folks to be more sex positive. And hopefully retailers eventually will do that as well. And not just the manufacturers. Oh, good. I yeah. love that. I it's love been that. pretty cool. Well, as you know, like the two of you have been in the field for a really long time too. And there's just a lot of misinformation or contradictory information because there, there wasn't, I mean, there's no sex ed in general. I know we're going to talk about that like in mm-hmm. schools or when we're young, but especially as adults and there wasn't any in the industry. So everyone was just doing their best. And Unfortunately, while doing their best, there can be some accidental harm that's done. And also just employees of manufacturers or staff at stores, they are not paid enough to do the really hard work that they do anyway. But then on top of that, they're supposed to like know how to respond to certain kinds of questions or know how to fully explain where to stick this particular sex toy and where not to. And and they can only go by whatever might be on the box or what their sales manager told them. And it's just like it's a lot of stress for them. And so I was really potentially a- annoying with a lot of my clients because in addition to the PR marketing with on the manufacturer side, it was always just like, you know, this we can shift this so that it's more accurate or like more reflective of how this would maybe really be used or 
what if we, you know, shifted this like promo material that you're sending to the store so that it's a little bit more educational so that the staff can use it and also shoppers can use it to just like learn something more. And it's just going to make everybody more money, which is what they needed to care about, understandably. And it'll make people, I don't know, healthier, more connected, feel more confident doing their jobs or more confident using the products themselves. And um, it's been a long haul, but now, yeah, I've had a bunch of different store chains have sent people. We've got distributors sending people to get trained and a lot of manufacturers whether they're, it's their sales staff or their marketing staff. So it's clearly, they know it's needed. And fortunately now it's more on trend yeah. to be like informed on the sex and wellness side of things. I thank love goodness. that. I know that is so important. And thank you for doing that work w- within the industry. And in terms of what we obviously have talked to you in person a bunch and having you on the show has been, I think, a long time coming. And you have this book that mm-hmm. is, awesome and was so needed because we've talked about the five love languages. I've read it a couple of times. You go to therapy sometimes. They they recommend the five love languages and it was written a long time ago. It's kind of religious in, in my eyes. So I wanted to know about what inspired you to write Speaking from the Heart because that's 18 languages, which makes more sense, of modern love as it's in conjunction with this five love languages. I'm assuming it's this updated, more uh, incredibly in-depth version that speaks to the majority of humans that five languages of love, Pavor, could it cover? So what's missing from that book or formula? And what does this speaking from the heart offer? Yeah, well, there's a lot missing from the original five. And you're totally right. It does have some religious over uh, undertones, sometimes overtones, I guess, depending on who you ask, and specifically evangelical Christianity. And that's not necessarily negative or bad if it were disclosed transparently from the start. Mm-hmm. So Part of it is an ethical thing. I I do feel that it's been unethically sold to the masses without disclosing sort of like what its origins or what it's really intended for and who it's intended for, who it leaves out and why, and who's this Gary Chapman guy? Is he really a counselor? No, he's not. (laughs) You know, that kind of stuff. But um, regardless, though, the concept has always been useful. And this book, the Speaking from the Heart book, is a total accident among a variety of things in my adult life, interestingly. Because I was using the five love languages as a concept in my private practice work, but just changing it all the time. And sometimes in real time, I would have to change something when I would notice how something did or didn't land with someone I was working with. And I was like, oh, good to know. Okay, need to change that and change this. And after enough years, I had a totally my, like my own essentially concept and idea of what a love language emotions wise, like really could be about and what it could like look and feel like and started making like a PDF one sheet tool for my fellow educators and therapists. And, um, and then that just sort of like became this much longer PDF that I started to sell as an ebook and did not expect it to blow up like it did. And so it's just been kind of expanding from there and like 18 love languages or modern love languages is what I call them is technically like not even enough because love is so subjective. It's so broad. It's very, very personal and individual. And so obviously five categories, they're general to the point of actually not really giving us a lot to work with. And uh, also just so many people were like, well, what if I don't resonate with any of them? What's wrong with me? And there was a lot of just, I don't know if it was on purpose or not, but just sort of treating the five love languages like it was this psychological biological thing that we all have wired in our brains and not just an idea. You know, there's nothing wrong with ideas, but there literally is nothing actual like biological or developmental about love languages Mm. in our brains. Um, There's been research to try to see if that is the case and so far completely inconclusive. Mm. So instead I was like, well, what if we can really take this into a very, like a somatic type of activity or exercise where We first start by just thinking, like, what does love actually feel like to me? Like, when I love someone or something, what does that feel like? Excitement, joy, comfort, safety, anxiousness, you know, who knows? Probably a lot of different feelings at once. And then flip it, like, what does it feel like to me when I feel loved? Like, what is that actual feeling? What are the body sensations? Because I would ask people, like, how do you define love? Or how do you know when you're feeling loved? And everybody would say something different. Mm -hmm. 
Of course they would. They're not like when someone gives me a gift or does an act of service, like nobody says that. I got a nice (laughs) one. Yeah. So I just realized like a lot of the activities I was doing in the group work I was doing or some of the one-on-one stuff, I could like make them into actual just worksheets that people could either buy in a workbook, which exists now, or a therapist can buy the workbook and just like use specific worksheets and activities for people And then they could shift out of utilizing something like the five love languages that is, even if it wasn't sort of what I feel is secret Christian propaganda, that's homophobic and, you know, cisphobic and misogynist and et cetera. um, Like that just offers a much more expansive human reflected type of explanation of how to figure out how to like navigate all kinds of relationships, not just the romantic ones. Yeah. And it's not 2,000 pages, by the way. I no. no it up. Yeah. So don't get scared, everyone. We're yeah. like, okay, how many pages is this going to be if there's 18? <laughs> mm-hmm. So it's well, like a reasonable size book. It's not a it's weapon. It's very, it's short. I mean, not everyone's looking at this, but like I'm. Ever go to YouTube, down. y'all. Go to YouTube. Uh, it's intentionally short and concise. And not everybody loves that. They want a deep dive and that will exist. I'm writing it now, but like, I don't want to intellectualize this any more than the rest of us already have. (laughs) So it's really just each modern love language has a one, one page explanation of just kind of like how, what this is, what it could look like, why it matters. And then what really makes this different on an accessibility side of things, each modern love language, instead of having pages of explanation, There's a page of what this can look like. And I use little illustrations to show examples of what it could be. And then Mm -hmm. a page of what it's not. Mm -hmm. And so little illustrations show examples of like, don't get me wrong. Don't get this twisted. This is not what this one means. So if you're doing any of this shit, that's something to look at for yourself for sure. Mm -hmm. And then flip to the page of examples. And then you can maybe practice those instead if you're trying to connect more with that particular modern love language. Yeah, I love that. I'm actually currently in um, in therapy looking at how I feel love um, or when I don't feel loved, specifically romantic relationships. And there's this this thing that I'm looking at like this. The when I don't feel love, it's a, it's one, it's missing touch, but it's also like this feeling I'm good, but it's going deeper because, you know, five love languages would be like, oh, touch is your primary love language. That is actually true for me. But now we're looking deeper. It's like there's a layer of not feeling liked. Um, and there's in this like in which they're like, is that acceptance? Is that belonging? Is that abandonment? There's so many layers there. And I won't go too deep into that, everyone. Which and then I do remember when I did Barbara Corellis's urban tantra training in 2020, sorry, 20. 14 numbers are weird in my brain right now. Someone saying the five love languages should really be seven because sexuality should be broken down into two instead of the one anyways, or maybe it was three. I'm not sure. But now we have 18 languages of modern love that you're saying isn't just about romantic relationships. So this is a big, Mm -hmm. broad question and you don't need to share unless you want to share all the 18 languages of modern love. But what are some examples of the uh, 18 languages of modern love that are in your book? Yeah. I mean, I don't require people to like buy the book to know what they are. So I'm totally happy to list them right now in alphabetical yeah. order. Like yes, literally please. Yes. Uh, I do it all the time. Order. Oh yeah. my God. I love <laughs> yeah, well, loves this. <laughs> it's not memorized in alphabetical. So don't worry. I'm bringing out my little list, <laughs> but yeah, I, I will say like one really important thing about the modern love languages. It is very centered around platonic love, platonic relationships. They apply to sexual and romantic by default but they, what's different about, especially the physical touch side of things, the physical touch idea has been like sexualized in a way that's then been used in really harmful ways to kind of like push people's boundaries and say, well, sex is my love language. So if you don't have sex with me, if you say no to me, you're re- revoking love and you're the harmful abuser. Mm-hmm. And it's really fucked up, obviously. Yeah. And it puts a lot of people disproportionately heterosexual women in this position of, I have to do this for him. I have to do this for them or her. It is disproportionately cisgender men weaponizing this idea, but they don't actually realize that there's anything wrong with it because they've had it, it's approved. It's sort of like permitted to use the five love languages as a way to try to manipulate partners into behaving in ways that they wouldn't naturally or ordinarily. And it shifts, it like kind of removes this like, the permission to just say no to not today or maybe later. And so anyway, just really important because it's also then very expansive and 
representative of, among other things, asexual folks and aromantic folks. Because aromantic people don't not feel love. They don't feel romantic love or desire for romantic relationships, you know? Um, and so there was also this feeling of like, well, I don't want to be with an aromantic person or an asexual because then I won't get any love or anything from them. And it's just like, y'all, oh my God. Okay, mm. we really need to do some work here. Wait, yeah. tangent, what's con- what's considered romance? Isn't that, because that's so vast, right? So mm-hmm. r- an aromantic. So if someone that w- would, if I brought them flowers and they were aromantic, they'd be like, get like, I don't want this. I don't know. Well, here's okay. the thing. Yeah. So like when we say I love Beyonce or I love my dog, I love my niece. I love my sister. We all, we love them. When we say we, I love my wife that we're not all talking about the same kind of love. Mm-hmm. So if someone is handing someone flowers, like that does not have a romantic connotation to it automatically. It can be. And in definitely heteronormativity type spaces or heteronormative like perceptions of relationships, flowers have often been a thing that a hetero man will give to a hetero woman to prove love of some kind. But not, by, not vice versa because that's weird, you know. <laughs> right. And which and we have a lot of hetero men who are like, no, I actually really love flowers, but people make fun of me when I ask about it. So I don't. But we also like give flowers to people who are sad. We give flowers to people to brighten their day. We give flowers to people because we walked by a place that we're selling some really beautiful sunflowers. And you were like, fuck yeah, I want to brighten up my my room with my roommate. Like, mm-hmm. so we're not all proposing marriage or whatever long-term romantic partnership with these people by doing these particular like things that signal love and affection. Mm-hmm. If there was someone, regardless of their romantic orientation, who was like, oh, fuck flowers, I fucking hate them. They are way too normative for me or they feel way too romancy, then great. But that's definitely going to be like an individual thing. Just like how some people are like, I don't do anal. Mm-hmm. I'll do everything else. But like anal, no, that's I, I don't love it. Don't love mm-hmm. it. And I am not a sex doll for other people. And mm-hmm. like that's individual for them too. But it doesn't mean like anal then is off the table for all people who... Yeah. You know, there's a, there's the a whole category of the the anti anal people, and then the same with asexuality. Right? People assume, oh, they don't have sex. They don't have a you exactly. know, there's no sex drive. I mean, like that, that's mm-hmm. not what asexuality. Yeah. Is. So a romantic is not a romantic human. It's your anti romance, right? Not necessarily anti, okay. but it's really about so it's a harsh it, word. But I'm just using it. Oh quick, no, yeah, okay. yeah. I yeah, know what you mean. Okay. It's more like when we think about sexual orientation or romantic orientation. It's very based on. Where are your romancy attraction feelings or your sexual draw to people? If you have any, where is it drawing you toward? What kinds of people? Is it based on gender? Is it based on other stuff? Do you have those feelings at all? And so for aromantic folks, they either feel none at all or very infrequent or maybe like conditional romantic desire or attraction toward other people with maybe a desire for like a long-term romantic partnership of some kind. Whereas asexual people, they either feel no sexual desire or attraction. Like the thing that draws them to people isn't like hubba hubba. I want to like rub genitals together or whatever, or they, they feel it infrequently or conditionally, but there are a lot of reasons people have sex and feeling sexual attraction is nearly one of hundreds. And so when we think about like, yeah, I have sex when I'm bored, I have sex when I'm curious about what this person will be like in bed. Uh, I have sex to fall asleep at night. I have sex to feel connected to the other person. When I feel lonely, when I don't want to eat food, I'd rather just have sex with someone. Like there are a lot of things if people are comfortable enough to be vulnerable and disclose it. A lot of reasons that we fuck other people. Mm -hmm. And sometimes we don't have any desire to fuck other people, but we might absolutely feel desire to like masturbate all day or like masturbating before bed is part of my ritual. And it's not because I'm sexually attracted to myself. It's Mm -hmm. because I like, I want all of the benefits of what an orgasm or what physical touch and that pleasure oxytocin type of experience gives me. And so hopefully for folks who are listening, it's definitely like a nutshell, quick and dirty explanation about it. Um, But asexual people, lots of asexual people have sex very frequently. And then lots of asexual people not only don't have sex, but they're like, I'm actually so disgusted. I'm absolutely not doing that ever. Not my, not of interest. And, um, every, all of them are valid, you know, and all of them also have 
fantastically connected, satisfying relationships. Mm -hmm. And they're not all polyamorous relationships either. Is it totally possible to be monogamous while on the asexual spectrum or on the aromantic spectrum too? So it's just really deeply individual. And so we can't like, you know, use broad strokes or, to, you know, sexual term, I suppose, to describe anybody, right? But especially when it comes to asexual, aromantic people. Thank you. I'm not going to interrupt because that was only the A. Shit. <laughs> oh my God, how oh, funny. Yeah. Um, I know, I'm right? Like, like, I'm not, I'm not going to ask any more questions until the end. Tangent zone. <laughs> okay, here we go. Alphabetical. So we've got accountability, active listening, acts of empathy, affirming communication, bestowing, emotional labor, engaged experiences, intentional time, personal growth, platonic touch, problem solving, providing, shared beliefs, solidarity, teamwork, thoughtful service, undivided attention, and upskilling. So many questions, but we probably don't have time to talk about all of them. Yeah, we can see a whole different episode, right? Our podcast is, yeah. Well, one of my questions, so about, so with all of these, was something that came to mind where, I, so if I think of like long term partnerships where people fall into this little, this zone of, feeling love with your partner. And I don't know if, if this is how they define feeling love. is because you, I heard intentional time mm-hmm. instead. So where it is just, just us, like our love is like we watch Netflix together and like, we just kind of coexist, which I think for a lot it's of people, not intentional with each other. It's it, kind of like it's less intentional, but okay. people I think might still identify that with love, which a lot of people get into that group. Like we're just kind of like mm-hmm. coexisting Was coexist. One of them. Maybe. Well, I, I would probably see what's also the way that I use modern love languages and encourage other people to, is to see how a lot of it's going to be like multiple representations of love. There will be a lot of overlap because we're not on there is no like categorization of an emotional experience. So for example, doing the sort of like separate thing, but together on a couch, I could say, sounds like an intentional time experience. You are literally, this is an intentional time to maybe connect with yourself or just do something for yourself, but also an engaged experience. It's an intentional time that you both know what you're doing here and why, and you are engaged separately, but together because Everyone's different, but like when I am with someone that I love on the couch and we're scrolling through our separate, you know, feeds with our headphones on and something is really fucking funny or so ridiculous, we tap the other person on the shoulder and they're like, oh my God, check this shit out. And so it's a really, I mean, it's a very engaged experience together while also not having to make it this like, oh, we're making a date. We're going to go someplace. We're going to spend money here, which is what a lot of people think or associate understandably with something like a, I don't know, an active service or whatever. I don't even remember. Or what quality all the time. With, yeah, quality mostly, time yeah, deal. Yeah. And so some people are like, well, I'm doing all this quality time. Like you should be, why aren't you feeling loved? What's wrong with you? I'm doing all the things and checking off the boxes. And it's like, well, it was it, was it intentional? Is everyone on the same page here about how this time is being used? Mm-hmm. Is I it love actually that. something this person likes and wants? That, yeah, that's so Were good. you that's on your phone partner. the whole time? Yeah, that's Sorry, my I'm partner. Like, totally. He thinks quality time is watching the TV. And I'm like, this is not, I'm not watching sports ball with you right now. This is not quality time mm-hmm. for me. Okay, yeah. sorry to interrupt, but I'm just like passionate. Well, I like this additional time. And, and it sounds like even within that, like y'all, so he's watching sports ball and, and thinks that that's y'all spending time together. And so the five, not talking shit about you, Gary Chapman. I don't even know if you're alive. Or, no, he died. Oh, okay. talk shit about him. He's right, very he, much alive and No, he died of cancer. I swear to God, he died. He died recently? Of cancer. I thought he died of cancer. Oh my God. Now I'm. Oh my gosh, can, let's live. I'm Googling. Googling right now. It's I'm Googling not that it. men are from Mars, women are from Venus, person. Well, I'll finish your question. Okay. I'll, I promise I'll Google. <laughs> so I'll the, get really the sports great. ball example, though, it's the five love languages, but quality time. But obviously it's missing some things because April's like, that's not what that is for me. So your, your book, the 18 languages of modern love, could probably even find within that something beyond quality time and all these other pieces that you just named that I don't remember all the things that could you know, oh, this is what this feels like for me. This is what this feels like for me, right? Yeah, it's like, adds. Like, it's not just w- we choose one. There's all these, mm-hmm. m- there's many layers. Yeah. We are, I know there was part of the five love language idea is that we are all monolingual 
about love, which has not only is that is any human being who feels multiple feelings is like, okay, I don't think that's true, but there is actual like research to show there that's out like even using the five, which are also just made up there. No one has been able to kind of prove monolinguality with that too. So by default, if we think about like how people can be multilingual in so many ways and certainly monolingual, but not because they're wired that way, you can learn a new language if you're able to, it's really about, okay, yeah, what is sort of like the layered experience here for each person's experience of love and also like what doesn't feel like love just to get it, like information about it. And then you'll notice with like the 18 and there's way more than 18, like they're, they're always coming up and floating in my head. Like this That's is why you're writing another book. <laughs> Basically. And yeah, yeah. part of the reason, like part of the thing with the book is like, not only are you a like, quote unquote multilingual without maybe realizing it when it comes to things like love and other emotions, it's going to be different from person to person and relationship to relationship that you're in. So like, you're not just, oh good, I'm quality time. I'm set until I die. I don't need to know anything else about love or my relationships are, I have the key to lasting love now, which is how the five is marketed. You might notice like, okay, I need something very specific with sexual partners, fine. And maybe it depends on the sexual partner and their gender or like how old they are or where you live, who knows. But then you might notice like, well, with your friendships or with family or a neighbor or roommate, you need very different things. That makes sense to me very quickly. And then you think, okay, well, the stuff that helped me feel all these things when I was 25, do I expect that to stay the same when I'm 26, 30, 42? I hope not. And a lot of people do. They really do think that I'm going to put on my dating profile what my love language is, and I'm only going to reply or swipe right on people who have the same one, because once we're matched, we're good forever. We're perfect. <laughs> and then you think, and here's my, my last sort of analogy to help this kind of sink in in like these sort of nutshell ways. Assuming that we are going to experience or need or want love the same way throughout our entire life in all relationships is as logical and reasonable as expecting that we're going to feel and need and want and identify the same amount of happiness all day, all, forever and ever for the rest of our lives and all of our relationships. Like, can you imagine expecting yourself to feel happy at the same level forever all the time? And if you dip low that, below that, there's something wrong with you. Some people be like, that sounds so nice. But everyone also yeah. like that sounds boring to me. You would get you would get really. I you know, I think humans yeah, would get pretty, pretty sick of that. Like, like, yeah, or if you totally. want to it's, it's well, just it, not how it works. <laughs> if all you're feeling is love and, or happiness all the time, it's not happy anymore. It's just neutral. Yeah. Unless you're like, a, you know, a Buddhist feel. and you're trying to be like pretty neutral about everything. But Buddhists, don't, it's not that they don't feel other feelings. It's how they navigate those feelings. <laughs> so it still is it's like a monk. OK, and an update for everyone. Gary Chapman is alive. Here's the thing. I read that book. I read like seven books in like six months and Seven Habits of Highly Effective People was the other one by Stephen Covey. And it's amazing. And I read those back to back and Stephen Covey died of a bike oh, accident. Got in it. That's why I mix them up. They're both white dudes that are like we're really only. disappointed in you you're wrong and bad and you I, did a terrible job I, I we're mad at you 2016 it's been a long time it's hard to keep it all yeah. i mean it's keep it all in our heads let alone you know on sounds on like sensical on paper but this yeah. the reason why i was like i can't imagine he's dead is because he is as old as he is and has made he's 86 as much, just look yep He's he's up there and he's still married to his wife. And um, when the 30th anniversary of the five love languages came out, a lot of the New York Times coverage was direct interviews with him at his current age. And that's when he started to sort of share a little bit more about the origin story of the five in a publication that like was accessible to all, not just like, you know, a keynote he'd be doing at a Christian university or something. It and that's how- 1992, that's when it was published because I just mm -hmm. looked up that too because I, yep. was, I uh, needed some, I, I was far off with the cancer thing. I don't know why I thought that maybe- it's it happened. It just was in my Wait, subconscious. Is the origin story though, is, is was he sharing that it is related to religion mm -hmm. in it? No, he no, doesn't okay. disclose. No okay. one will ever disclose. It's really. That's why it has the, the the under overtones. Like it's tricky. Like you don't. Oh, yeah. There's, yeah. It doesn't say on the back of the book anything. And then all of a sudden, like you see something about God in there. Yep. And also like the publisher is a Bible publisher. It's not uh, like a regular publisher. And they do only Bibles and then like his stuff and all of the offshoots. And again, it's like 
this isn't about being anti-religion. It's about anti-non-disclosure, right? And how that harms people, especially anybody trying to recover from religious trauma, but like also for secular people or atheists or people who are like, I don't want, don't fool me into reading something that like, I don't know, tells me this is the the way that I'm going to be loved forever. And it is the secret to my marriage never ending without also telling me that like the guy who made this stuff up based it all off of his own experience of marriage. Mm. And then what he observed Christian couples in his parish also doing. Yeah. He's a, uh, he's a pastor. Uh, made it from there. Yeah, yeah. He's a pastor and he, he's not uh, known for liking scientific principles at all. Oh, no. And he's also been very, he's openly homophobic. It's been scrubbed from the internet, but not the Wayback machine. I've got all the screenshots. The Wayback machine exists. Mm-hmm. Everyone. Scrubbing yeah. the internet is a quite, yeah. Like, like, fully if yeah. People want to know a little bit more about sort of just like the, je- the breakdown of why the five themselves needed an update and, ex- and expand and an extension. The, the book definitely breaks down sort of some of the issues, including, you know, the issues of sexualizing touch or sexualizing love. And maybe that'll also help for some folks who are like, I don't see the issue yet, you know, um, and that's totally OK. And part of the goal, I don't need anybody to feel the same way that I do or my colleagues or whoever else. It's really about I just think people deserve to know what is true about the things that they are consuming and using to navigate this very sticky, complicated world. So that's what I'm, my goal is to just provide that information. Which I think you do a great job. And I want to, uh, we're going to switch gears in a moment. However, that book, the 18, I'm just going to call it the 18 languages of modern love that has a workbook that accompanies the book, mm-hmm. right? The, yeah. uh, and it's paperback. And then you, you can get that and, and work with, is it with partners or partner or yeah, well, a lot individualized? Of, totally. Well, so, I mean, I'm going to, again, I'll hold it up for the people who are, have like the video available. It's a bit thicker than like the regular book, but each page is an individual activity. And a lot I can, of like, read a lot I of like writing from here. Just it's big we were print. just talking about this before we recorded. Yeah. yeah it's like it's all the too things, much writing too. Yeah. yeah. And it's all, it's just written out. I mean, among the things I paid people of a variety of different like neurodiversities and, and abilities to just tell me like, are these instructions clear? Like, does this make sense to you? Can you read this font? Can you read this size? Are these colors okay? And another thing that I wish, you know, more folks were able to do because it's like, it, if it works for me, great. But like, then it, I'm making something for myself and not necessarily other people outside of myself, you know? And so it's um, really like meant to be a step-by-step process that people do by themselves for sure. And I have had people share with me that they've bought two workbooks or they photocopy. I don't love that, but like, whatever. They photocopy the one they buy and then they like hand the worksheet to someone they're dating. And like, they'll do these little activities together over a beer or a glass of wine, which is like intentional time, engage experience and personal growth. Side note. I love that. Three modern love language at, mm-hmm. modern love languages at a time. Or just then, buy, bo- buy two or I three mean, copies of the workbook. Buy all of them, right? Like, yeah. sell me out. I would love it. It's just something that for some people, because it's very much more accepted to like do some of that personal growth work without just immediately going into the deep end and mm-hmm. getting really, really deep and maybe really heavy. And um, they're able to then just kind of like take little steps into getting closer to what their goals might be. And if they can share that with a partner, that's already a green flag that their partner is down, you know, and yeah. ready for it. And then they might just, the goal is to get more information to work with, you know, mm-hmm. not to like feel good or bad or better, or even necessarily hopeful. Like I'm, I'm very much like, who knows what the future holds, who even knows what things are going to be like for you and everyone else in six months, let alone six years. Yeah. But this is information you can add to like your dossier of evidence about like what you know about yourself and what you maybe know, but don't always want to feel good about yourself and just like add it to that pile You've got more to work with while you're just trying to find the people you want to build community with. 
That's uh, and I don't want to make this about us and our book, but the way we Good. wrote it, it's a choose like choose your own adventure, but it's choose your own pleasure path. Mm-hmm. It's something that you can access. Or you can read from front to back, or you can choose this one area of like here's where my challenge is, or or here's the goal that I want to work towards, and that applies now. But then maybe later in six months or a year, it's like okay, what's the new thing? Because we're constantly changing, and it's more about sex, but there is relationships, communication skills, but similar concept, right? It's like we're mm-hmm. constantly changing. It's okay. Where am I at now? Maybe I'm in this new relationship. I'm having this challenge with my work business partner, and I need to learn about more Are about you like that right now. No, not anymore. Oh, okay. <laughs> but I love that, and I think it's really realistic about as opposed to saying there is one way to be. Mm-hmm. Um, okay, so we want to. Our computer's being weird, but we are switching gears There's right now. Weird shit happening <laughs> with the communication. Yeah. Yes. Um, <laughs> but the communication's good. There's just some weird stuff happening with our Zoom thing. But I want to ask you more about the Everyone Deserves Sex Ed. So you are the founder of Everyone Deserves Sex Ed, which is also EDSE, everyone. And this is a sex educator certification training program, an online education program. And you do some work with like parent child education as well. Mm-hmm. Um, so, first, uh, before we talk a little more about that, that. Uh, what is the current state of sex education speaking to the United States? This is 2024, everyone, anal August. And I'm curious about that. <laughs> yeah, I like actually have literal stats around like laws for sex ed and state to state. Like I use this information a lot to help give people context around like why do so many of us not know anything? And I just love I, you so much. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Which kind of love? Which like, are the 18 you're le- better yeah. than Siri? I just love you. Okay. Sorry. That's she all. She loves stats too. But yeah. No, it's Gemini, so Gemini is another one that, that oh, I yeah. think be, but yes. Yeah. Okay. Misunderstood sun sign. So <laughs> anyway, <laughs> the stats we have right now are based off of August of 2023. We'll have them updated again. Uh, there's an, a nonprofit called the Guttmacher Institute that tracks a lot of policymaking related to things like sex ed and HIV education. So as of August of last year, 39 states and Washington, D.C. mandated some kind of sex ed and or HIV education. So that means all the other states, the like 10 or 11, no law at all requiring any kind of sex ed. But it gets worse than this. Because of those 39 and Washington, D.C., 29 of them require that abstinence be stressed, which analogy time is like teaching driving by emphasizing staying home. (laughs) It's like you can talk about not driving, uh, but you also need analogy. Like you got to also talk about driving because it's driving school education. Anyway, because people are probably going to drive at some point, too. Anyway, that's great. That's the best analogy I have ever heard. I'm I'm probably going to use that later. Okay, I will credit you. Please do. So of those 39 in Washington, D.C., 19 of them require emphasizing sexual activity only within marriage, which is like teaching driving by emphasizing driving cars you legally own. Okay, okay wait. So 29, 29, oh, like you that. said 29 focus on abstinence. They require then, stressing or, abstinence. Yeah. Okay. And then 39 are not having sex before marriage. 30 no. Days? So no. Oh. 39 and Washington, D.C. in general require some kind of sex ed. Okay. Got it. Got it. And so and the, other, so the other 11, okay. zero laws require no any law. sex ed. They don't require it. But requiring sex ed, the bar is so low that requiring sex ed doesn't mean jack. It could yeah. mean I'm requiring sex ed to talk about things like, you know, a man with a beard in the sky judging you for touching your penis. Like there's no law against that in a general sex ed mandate from state to state. Like the states themselves have very particular unique policies. And some actually have the same kinds of policies because these initial bills are written by one or two organizations that write like mad lib fill in the blank type of bills and then send them to different legislators to fill in the blank for their state and their name. So that's how we got things like the various bathroom bills and the anti-trans bills that are now laws that are all basically the same. And a lot of the also the anti-abortion or abortion restriction laws all came from the same source and have just been sort of uh, copied, pasted from state to state. What state and sorry, but what what states uh, can we commend as doing a decent job with mm-hmm. sex education? Because like, I know my friend's kid member in Portland are my my friend that I grew up with her and she has two kids and and her kids, they go to school in Portland and one is eight and one is six. And we had our shameless sex bag and he's and the little boy who was eight said, I know what that is. And I said, you know what? What is? And he said that word sex. We just learned about it in school. And I was like, what did you learn? And then he talked about the 
the pleasure piece a little bit, yeah. not much. And his mom was like very proud. And, and yeah. I was like, well, so I just want to know if, yeah. if, poor, if it's uh, obviously cities are all well, different, but are there any states that we can be like, wow, they're really setting the bar higher than. So, you're can. Saying, so the 39 that requires some form of sex ed, and then 29, it's abstinence. Require abstinence. Require abstinence. And then when, then the lower one with that. What, 19 if, uh-huh. required emphasizing sex only within marriage. Okay. 19. So who is, so what are the few that are actually, yeah, hopefully Oregon. Well, what, I, I can, what I can say is I don't have access to full state policy, state to state, but California does a pretty good job. Massachusetts has done a pretty good job. Oregon has done a pretty good job. And I know that there, this doesn't mean it's the only three, but those are the ones I can confidently say have some policy that's been pretty forward thinking. Like California was the first state in general to change the legal definition of consent from like no means no to yes means yes, mm-hmm. which again, the bar is low. We need more than yes means yes. But like that was pretty novel for a state many, many years ago to actually make that into law, which then made it into sex ed curricula approved by the state. So thank you, by the way. Thank you. I'm glad to know at least yeah. that some humans out there are getting decent sex education. It's right? happening. We're not gonna say it's, it's, the, the, yeah. it's not the best. And well, here's the thing. Still, it's better than nothing. But we got to start somewhere, right? Like, so there are definitely some schools that will bring in their own sex ed or outside sex educator, depending on funding. And there are, regardless of the state you're in, some individual parents and caregivers also are sort of banding together and bringing in private sex ed, either for their own kids or for maybe a community group. I've had a couple reach out and have sex ed classes with me through Etsy to supplement whatever they're getting in school, if they're getting anything. So we're not totally SOL if we happen to be living in a state like Florida or Texas. It just means there's usually more ex- expense and more effort involved, but also thank goodness we've got access to a variety of kinds of books that can be a really good starting point for parents and caregivers who are worried about what's in their school and also for parents and caregivers who are homeschooling. And they're like, who's going to handle the sex ed part? We can't. Like, we're not qualified to do this shit. So there's there's definitely hope. And if people want more of the like sort of stat stuff, I've, I've got more about just sort of like how even in 2024, it's pretty dismal. Um, but it's there's never been a point where like school sex ed has been like, ooh, this is pretty good. Like we didn't ju- we didn't start actually having sex ed as like a a thing that could be systemized and put into schools until like early in the 19, I want to say the 1900s, 1920s. It, the idea was we should probably have something in school. And from there, it only kind of occurred to folks around like the sexual revolution for that sex ed should also include the concept of feeling good and not just babies and STIs. Yeah. And uh, then starting from the 80s until now, in part, thanks, Reagan, we had a lot of political pearl clutching and attacking on the idea of sex ed being something that was a little bit more like, yeah, people also have sex because it feels good. And also for these other reasons. And so we want to help you navigate this. And that's why we started getting abstinence only or abstinence stressed becoming the norm and the and federal funded norm that then, depending on the school or the state, they had to get what they could get funding for. And so that's what they put in the schools, you know, so it really it's complicated and layered, but that's why like organizations like everyone deserves sex ed exists. It's why sex educators like the three of us exist. Like there's a lot of work that can be done outside of the school system. And the hard thing is just to help other people learn that people like us do exist and that there are alternatives and other options. Yeah. We're, Amy and I are both cracking up because we have our noise canceling headphones on and my dog is next to me snoring. You can hear it through and I'm like, we can hear it through our headphones. Yeah. And I'm like, I hope you can't hear that. I can't home. hear or it, but I want to. Okay. It's it's really cute. His it's not head. that he finds his topic. He's, he's not a stats guy, you know. So, I'm, I'm, I'm like, not offended. Oh my God. His snore, I'm like, if she hears it. Like, I'll snoring. listen when it's not stats. <laughs> his head is buried in the pillow funny. next to me. And he's like... So I'm so I was listening and I was like, oh, my God, legend. Stop. He never snores either. All right. So Amy has a question, but I wanted you to know. You kind of already commented on this a little bit. But so I'm curious about how does everyone deserve sex ed again? Everyone EDSC to keep it. Edsy. How does everyone everyone deserve sex ed fit into all of this? Like what makes everyone deserve sex ed Edsy different from other sex education trainings? 
Yeah. Well, so partly the sex ed certification is literally available to anybody who is like, I don't know fucking anything about this shit. And I want to benefit my family or community or do a better job at my job or really anyone who's like, I need something because I'm not, I don't know where else to get it. So it's a training that literally anybody from recent high school grads, we had an 18 year old take our most recent certification because they made a zine in high school to like be sex ed materials for their friends. It was just like, oh my God, I love you. Come, come all the time. Like, hell yeah. I'm so flattered. And um, we have clergy come in who are like, Whoa. I don't know what to think, but I do know that this shit is making like people in my community, like not want to live anymore. And that's a problem and definitely goes wow. against my religious beliefs. So I need to figure out how to talk about things like gender or love and relationships. Good for them um, for yeah. taking action. Right? Yeah. 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 Awesome. And it's yeah. heavy. We've yeah. got therapists who are like, yeah, my my academic training was fucking useless when it came to things like sex outside of heteronormativity and like pregnancy prevention and monogamy and all the kinds of stuff. So they're like, I need to supplement my existing you know, training. We also have well-seasoned sex educators who just because they know that they need to are just re-upping their knowledge, you know, throughout their careers. And then we've got people who are like, I'm just a parent and I live in Galveston, Texas. And um, I have always been the parent that like my kids and their friends have come to for help. And so I want to up my game a little and be an even better, safer resource for them. So there's no prerequisite for like who's permitted and allowed in. And it's not academic because it's academic trainings are useless for regular people who want to be doing on the ground work. So it's really about like, here's what's true about this shit. Here is a reframe that makes it expansive and inclusive of all the stuff that you might not even realize other materials aren't inclusive or expansive of. And we're going to help you figure out like, how do I answer this kind of a question or how do I explain this concept without getting overwhelmed or giving too much information And then also like we teach communication tools and facilitation skills and things to look out for when you're trying to engage with other people. Um, And so it's a really like encompassing comprehensive training that also doesn't require people spend like a year or two doing it because some of us don't have that kind of time. And so it's also completely live. There's nothing passive about it. And that's, partly because most of the trainings that are available are pre-recorded and there's literally nothing wrong with that. But I know there are some people, myself included, who don't learn very well from mm-hmm. looking at a screen and not talking to anyone or practicing anything. Yeah. And then suddenly you have to like write a paper or do a, a quiz or something. And it's like, oh my God, I would be SOL if that was my only option. So that's this a is pa- page you. who works with us as a social mm-hmm. media. And she, we're going to, you know, send anyways, she, we told her there's uh, all these trainings. You could do this one right now. This one's online. She's like, no, I, d- I want to, uh, I work better with people. Mm-hmm. And also she wants to work with people, you know, director of marketing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So director of marketing, the term, but she wants to actually engage with people. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. I appreciate that about your program too. And there's only two sessions a year right now. Yeah. Cause it's, we've changed the schedule to make it even more accessible for people. Cause it's on Fridays, Saturdays, and Sundays. And so instead of having them be like consecutive weeks, it's every other week. So it does extend it. Maybe you'll be, you'll still be done probably within like three months, mm-hmm. which is still really, really freaking fast. Um, but yeah. it also means like you have like the late, the longest we'll be in class together is from 10 AM to 4 PM. So you have the rest of your day. You can find childcare. Your kid can also sit with you. We have people who have their kids just in the background doing oh, that specific time, that's right? Real specific, specific time. time. Yes. Yeah. Yes. West coast. Yeah. And, um, and then you have the next weekend where if you need to do the family stuff or you need to clean the house or all this, all, whatever else we have to do on the weekends, because mm-hmm. they're precious, you can. And then you just be prepared for the next weekend to be in class with us. And um, I know like I'm biased, but I've been teaching this since 2019, Some of sometimes three times a year since 2019. And I've, I've, it's so fun. Like I, it's still so fun. And I have the attendees who are just like, this feels weird because I'm glad this is going to come to an end soon, but I'm starting to feel sad knowing that day 13 is coming yeah. and we're on day nine and I only have four more days or three more days to like be with all of you. And I know they're not doing it just to like make me feel good because I could, I don't, I don't need people to, you know, think I'm fun or think it's fun really. Um, but what they they share ultimately is 
they're in a space where they feel really comfortable to like really be them their full selves and ask all the questions. And they know that there are people there who share similar values that maybe others in their community think are weird or bad and sinful or negative. And so instead of feeling kind of like the odd one out or, you know, the weirdo, they're in a group of fellow odd ones out and weirdos who are like, yeah, I want to go to a training that isn't just going to be saying like, orgasms are amazing, have one a day, but also like, here's how this works. And what if orgasm wasn't the only thing we talked about? What if joy and fun and pleasure and play was part of it? And we're also going to be talking about the stuff from a justice lens. So it's like, here's how to talk about this. And here's why, because here's who was left out when we use language that is only in the textbooks. Or here's who's left out if we're only referring to sex as penises in a vagina. And, you know, here, here's the other things that are left out just that benefit everybody if you're only talking about this topic from this one perspective. And so people also then start feeling way more confident and comfortable and shifting out of the imposter syndrome stuff or like the, the fear of like, oh, I don't want to say the wrong thing or leave someone out. It's like, you're always going to. So let's move on from that fear and instead like get some skills that make you feel a little bit more connected to I it love, all. I love that, that you, the why teachings, right? The why instead of, this is the language we use. It's, mm -hmm. And sometimes that's when people, when you talk about the normies or the mainstream folks, they get flustered or upset or it's a lot of cis white dudes. Okay. Mm -hmm. And I'm not... Mm -hmm condemning or, or saying anything's wrong with all all dudes there's a lot of this white women I do, feel I, the same I, I, way too I, and, why should i have to learn that it's a new way to speak yeah. gendered thing it's just i my mom for instance is sure. uh very she gets really confused i think teaching the why it's like hey uh this analogy with the the driving and then the abstinence being like never never leaving your house and and learning how to drive that's so Good. Uh, so it, after people finish Etsy, if uh, in, you kind of talked about who who can do this, right? Mm -hmm. And then all the personal benefits that they may receive and probably will receive. What do folks do with this after? Uh, obviously, if you're maintaining knowledge, which I would love to do, that's one thing. But what about the other folks out there? Yeah. So we don't always track every single person's trajectory. So I can go by what people have shared with me after graduating. Some people are just adding it to the things on their resume so that they feel more official. And that's understandable. We're, you know, we're all conditioned in very particular ways. You're official without a certificate as well. I just mm. want folks to hear, you know, like you're, what does official even mean? But anyway, so some people just use it to feel more comfortable and better about their work. Others use it because they know that they can't get credentialed by some of the exclusionary organizations that require, for example, a bachelor's degree to even walk through the door. Mm -hmm. which is like so classist and also mm -hmm. like racist and sexist and uh, varieties of things like hugely problematic. So they're like, this is the thing that is actually going to maybe get people to take me more seriously when they see that I've, I've done a particular kind of training that is known for a certain kind of work and, um, and gives me an option when I know that I don't have any choice to go anyplace else. So that that's also something that people use just for legitimacy and reaching out for jobs related to sex and sexuality. And then some folks use it because they want to build something for themselves and they want there to be some kind of like consistent knowledge among the people that they're working with. And so like they will go themselves and then they'll send a couple of employees or they'll send a couple of colleagues and the goal being eventually everyone's kind of like on the same page about stuff and you don't have to worry about the person who's in charge of marketing using language that is very antiquated and actually hurts people or dehumanizes people because they took the same training, you know? And so there, there's that. And then there's people like the parents or the clergy members, or some of them are in like nonprofit world and they're just like, I need this so that I can then start to like drip this information out to other places or other people that I'm working with, because this is the thing I have the most control over in terms of change making mm -hmm. that sort of incremental shift yeah. versus trying to like go all the way to the top and change like how the laws are written. Like there are organizations that do things like that, but if that worked, we would have been fine back in this, you know, starting yeah. from the seventies. It's obviously so, not working. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. This free speech yeah. coalition does do a lot of mm -hmm. incredible work within a lot of uh, lobbying work, lobbying mm -hmm. work, which is amazing. And writing, getting legislation written and rewritten is, is it's a big feat. And, uh, well, this isn't a bureaucratic 
uh, thing that you and I and Amy are talking about. This is kind of a human. I think it's a human thing. Mm -hmm. Right. And obviously bureaucracies are involved in all of our fucking day to days. But I'm really grateful for this offering. And Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. And I looked at your website, the Etsy website, and your teaching staff is just, I mean, it's its a lot of humans, but there's, you can see all these different, I mean, just looking at it and you're like, wow, this is a wealth of experiences and perspectives. And it's not just like, here's our four teachers, you know, it's, it's just <laughs> extensive yeah. and Im- impressive. And I'm sure that changes, right? Um, and so you're, you're, the next year, you know, this is 2024, I know that you have a spring offering and a fall offering. Mm-hmm. So this is going to be a multi-layer question because we do have to wrap up and let everyone go and carry on with the days. How can people learn more about Etsy and sign up for Etsy for next year, 2025 and beyond? Also, how and where can people buy your book? How can they work with you? Because I know you work personally with people as well. Give us all the things. Yeah. Well, everyone deserves sexed.com is definitely the hub for all of the Etsy stuff and the certification work. And uh, every session has Some of the same basic educators, but we have about 10 that we have along with me in each session. And you can see a list of people who were in the the summer session if people want an idea of who they are. And then uh, annhottership.com is where you can find out about me. There's a link there to the Modern Love Languages and a separate website where you can like buy the book and stuff. And the Modern lovelanguages.com is where you can see the book, see the workbook. And there's also the, like some relationship coaching offerings for people who are like really wanting to kind of like dive in and work with me directly around like, how do I apply this stuff to my life or my relationship? And then when are the next, so you said summer session, cause it's August when we're recording this. So is there anything left in 2024 if folks are no, interested or is it? 2024 just ended actually, okay, got but it. in 2025, we have the spring session starting March 1st and then the fall session. Let me look at my paper. Start. Was it October? Uh, October? September 13th. September, yeah. Okay. 2025. yeah. So people, and you do close those things. It's not open-ended in, in right. Open it's people. sold out. It, 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 yeah. It sold out yeah. last time. Yeah. yeah. They, they do tend to sell out, though 2023, we didn't have sellouts. The maximum size for the class is around 15. And oh, that's it's amazing. Reserved. It's, yeah, it's one of the re- other reasons why people like it. Yeah. Three of them are reserved for scholarship people. So there are basically 12 application spots that are available in each session. So it is something that you do want to sign up probably as soon as you're able to, just in case it does sell out, but it'll never be any bigger than 15. And if it's bigger than 15, it just means there was some sort of special exception had to be made for some okay. some reason, but probably 20 would be like the, the serious cutoff. And I know you offer, you can pay in installments, um, oh, yeah. which I think is really cool. And if you all, we get asked, Amy and I get emails pretty regularly about how to become a certified sex educator, how to enhance their, like even people at Swan Medical where we've had Dr. Castillo and Remy on the show and, and um, on our book about hormone um, therapies and intimate wellness. And uh, some of their office folks want to expand their knowledge on sexual oh. health mm-hmm. and wellness. And uh, we recommended Etsy. So if you are interested in what Anne is curating really uh please check out everyone deserves sex ed.com all of the links will be in our show notes and we definitely will have Anne back because there's just not enough time to cover all of your knowledge and if people want those stats meaning april lampert probably right here she probably wants some. i love stats so much because it also it feeds the the machine of people knowing the numbers and where i love stats and numbers and every time i'm guested on any mainstream shows they like love the stats so mm-hmm. i love stats and I'll credit you. And I think Amy, Amy sometimes hates stats and then they always change. And sometimes you love them. I don't hate stats. They just won't stick in my brain. I hear I'm like, that's interesting. I just, it'll go in one ear out the other. It's interesting. You remember like people's authors names and like book page numbers. And I'm like, only if it's meaningful. It's really (laughs) incredible. Otherwise I'm like, "Eh." brains are weird, but I I can, I'll send you, um, April, I'll send you the actual like slides that I have that have the, um, driving analogy under each one. Cause it really helps. Is this the gifting love language? I'm just kidding. (laughs) It is bestowing for sure. And shared beliefs. Oh, 
You just yeah. got bestowed with some shared beliefs. I'm going to buy this book and I'm going to recommend Amy and I have, well, one of our therapists is the same. I think it would be great for her to incorporate some of this knowledge too. I'm not going to like try to should my therapist, but I'm <laughs> seeing her tomorrow. I got to oh, think about my own well, shit for a while. Yeah, yeah. Well, here you go. Um, I got my own problems. <laughs> Anne Hodder ship everyone and ship with two P's. Uh, CSE, please, please. If you haven't rated us, rate us review us. What that does is help more folks find folks like Ann Hodder Ship and all of the incredible guests that we have on our show. And it also makes us feel good sometimes, which we need a little boost. We love boosting you all. <laughs> help us boost our shelves because it gets, you know, it's hard out there. It's hard out there sometimes in this sex education field. And Amy and I, uh, we have not missed a Tuesday in seven plus years. And this is a free resource for you. So like us, Buy the stuff that we talk about on our show because we only pick products and services and things and people guests. and guests that we really believe in and love. Sometimes we've had, you know, a different different relationships with some of our guests. Uh, uh, yeah, there was some of them were like, uh oh, yeah, we're like, we gotta, <laughs> we, uh, we, and we tend to not edit things out unless, yeah, my dog farts or snores too loud. <laughs> that that usually stays in too. Yeah. All right, you all, we will see you next Tuesday. And uh, Amy, I love you and love you. Thank you. Ciao for now, everyone. <laughs>